Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering care of the newborn. Uh, guys, if you haven't done so already, you know what I'm about to ask you to do. Please do not forget to like and subscribe below. That's one of the major ways that you can help support this channel. Also, by sharing my content, I get you know, so many emails every day, Professor D, thank you. You helped me pass my ATI, my HESI, my NCLEX. If you want to support this channel, please like and subscribe and be sure to share my content videos with any friends, classmates, coworkers, anyone you know that my videos would be of assistance to them. Please don't forget, I'm also across all um, the major uh, social network platforms, but I'm kind of old, so maybe not all because I don't even know all that's out there. But you can find Nexus Nursing on TikTok, Instagram, uh, Facebook. So make sure you check me out there and the content that I upload on those platforms are different than what you get every Sunday here on YouTube. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. First question. The nurse is discussing the neonatal blood screening test with the new mother. The nurse knows that more teaching is needed when the mother states that which of the following diseases is included in the screening test. One, hypothyroidism. Two, sickle cell anemia. Three, galactosemia. Or four, cerebral palsy. And guys, the correct answer is four, cerebral palsy. Guys, cerebral palsy, this is um, when the patient has a uh, dysfunction or discoordination in muscle and movement, and it stems from a brain injury. This is not something that uh, patients, uh, newborns are screened for. Choices one, two, and three, they absolutely are screened at birth. So let's go over them. Hypothyroidism, that's when the patient has like an absence or a dysfunction of the thyroid gland. Two, sickle cell anemia. I've talked about this ad nauseum, guys. Sickle cell anemia, a couple important things you need to know. Number one, it's an autosomal recessive trait, uh, excuse me, autosomal recessive disease or disorder. And what happens is the red blood cells, which carry hemoglobin, instead of being nice and round and a uh, dish shape, they turn into what? Sickle shape, shape. sickled shape. And that's why it's called um, sickle cell anemia. At birth, um, newborns are screened for that. And the third one, galactosemia. That is when the patient lacks the enzyme that actually um, breaks down the, um, or um, metabolizes, I should say, the um, galactose. Okay, so one, two, and three, absolutely these newborns are screened for um, at birth, but cerebral palsy, absolutely not. And like I said, guys, that's just the motor dysfunction and the, what it stems from, because that's what's important for you guys to know. What that motor dysfunction stems from is brain injury. No screen, not no screen, but newborn is not screened for that. All right, guys, next question. The nursery nurse is careful to wear gloves when admitting neonates in the nursery. Which of the following is the scientific rationale for this action? One, meconium is filled with enteric bacteria. Two, amniotic fluid may contain harmful viruses. Three, the high alkalinity of fecal urine is caustic to the skin. Or four, the baby the baby's high risk for infection and must be protected. I know I said I was giving up coffee, but if you guys have been watching my videos by now, you know I'd be lying about that. I'm trying though. All right, guys, so the correct answer is two, amniotic fluid may contain harmful viruses. And that's absolutely true. Harmful viruses like what, Professor D? HIV, hepatitis B, okay? That am amniotic fluid is a perfect medium for bacteria or vi uh, viral viral growth, okay? So that's why they wear gloves to protect themselves. Now let's look at um, the other choices. One, meconium's filled with inter... Really? Really? Okay, let's look at this, guys. Meconium, this is the first stool that this neonate ever has. How is it filled with, say, with enteric bacteria? Their gut is still sterile. They were just born. This patient hasn't even... How? So, guys, you know that's false. Absolutely false. It's not um, filled with um, uh, enteric bacteria. That stool is still sterile, so that's false. Choice three, the high alkalinity of fetal urine is caustic to the skin. 
the fetal urine is not highly alkalinic. So that's false. And choice four, the baby is high risk for infection and must be protected. This is how NCLEX tries to trick you guys. Because the statement is true. The statement. The newborn baby is high risk for infection and they must be protected. That is absolutely true. But that's not why nurses put on gloves. Nurses put on gloves to protect themselves, not to protect the patient. So even choice, even though choice number four is a true statement, does it answer the question? And it does it. And guys, you have to be careful with this because when you're taking these tests, these test writers, and I know this because I used to be one of them, they will purposely put a true statement as an answer choice. Before you choose it, go back to the question and say to yourself, okay, this is true, but is it answering my particular question? And if it's not, it's wrong. And so for this uh, question, the correct answer is two. They're putting on gloves because the amniotic fluid, which will still be covering the baby, the newborn, is, you know, a medium for vi you know viruses, pathogens, and the nurses have to protect themselves. Remember, if it's wet, you're going to put on gloves. If it's, you know, fecal matter, if it's vomitus, sputum, whatever, it's wet, we're putting on gloves. Why? To protect ourselves. Next question. A full-term newborn was just born. Which nursing intervention is important for the nurse to perform first? One, remove wet blankets. Two, assess APGAR score. Three, insert eye prophylaxis. Or four, elicit the Moreau reflex. And guys, the correct answer is one, remove wet blankets. Why? Think about it. This newborn who's just born, they're tiny. They have what? A very tiny little body, very small surface area. We want to prevent them from um, losing the heat in their body, right? So that's why we want to remove the wet blankets. We do not want that patient to become hypothermic. That is a big concern. That's why you dry them off immediately. You cover them up. You put the little, what do you call it? I forget what you call it, like the the cap, the little thing you put on their head, you put that to prevent the heat from leaving their body. And, you know, you kill two birds with one stone because when the baby's, you know, just the newborn's just born, they kind of have look like a corn head, cone head, right? And so their head is shaped really weird. So that little hat covers all of that up. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone. But the purpose of that is to prevent the newborn from suffering of hypothermia. Very important, guys. We want to decrease the heat loss. So let's look at our other choices that are wrong. Choice two, assess APGAR score. I want you to think about that. When do we do the APGAR score? The first APGAR score, you do it two times, guys, by the way. But the first APGAR score, we do it what? One minute after delivery. So if you were to choose choice number two that says assess APGAR score, that means you would do absolutely nothing for a whole minute until you do the APGAR score before you do anything else. Does that make sense? Absolutely not. So you know that can't be the answer. Choice number three, insert eye prophylaxis. Yes, the eye prophylaxis is important, but that you can do after you've dried off the newborn. You can do that after you've allowed the newborn and the new mother to bond. Bonding is very important, right? You're going to put the newborn directly on the mother's chest so that the, the bonding process can begin, and you can do that afterwards. So that's not going to be the first thing that you do. And choice floor, choice floor, choice four, elicit the Moreau reflex. So guys, you can do that after you've established that the newborn is breathing independently. That's not going to be the first thing that you're going to do. Um, next question. To reduce the risk of hypoglycemia in a full term newborn weighing 2,900 grams, what should the nurse do? One, maintain the infant's temperature above 97.7 Fahrenheit. Two, feed the infant glucose water every three hours until breastfeeding well. Three, assess blood glucose every three hours for the first 12 hours. Or four, encourage the mother to breastfeed every four hours. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is one, Maintain the infant's temperature above 97.7. Why? I talked to you about this already. One of the biggest things with a newborn is what? Preventing hypothermia. Very, very important. Why? We don't want to cause uh, the newborn to have cold stress syndrome. 
why would cold stress syndrome be a concern to us? Go back to the question. In the question, what is it saying? To reduce the risk of hypoglycemia, which means the blood sugar going too low. What does cold stress syndrome, keeping the patient warm and hypoglycemia, what do they all have in common? I want you to think about it because this is how the critical thinking works, guys. We know that the more you move about, right? The more energy you're using, the more calories you're burning, the more your metabolism is increasing and the lower your blood sugar goes, right? Okay, so if you have a newborn, they were just delivered, they're a newborn, they don't know how to shiver yet, right? They're a newborn, they're cold, they have cold stress syndrome, their body's trying to keep them warm, in the effort of trying to keep them warm, guess what's going to go down? The blood sugar. We want to prevent hypoglycemia. So we want to make sure that we keep them warm so they don't have cold stress syndrome. So it's like a domino effect. So it doesn't decrease the patient's blood glucose. So that is the correct answer. Now let's look at our other choices. We have choice two. Feed the infant glucose water every three hours until breastfeeding. Okay, guys. We're not giving the patient glucose water. That patient is either going to get breast milk or formula, but we're not going to give them glucose water. So that definitely is not the answer. Choice um, three, assess the blood glucose every three hours for the first 12 hours. That's not necessary. That's it's just not. You have choice four, encourage the mother to breastfeed every four hours. Um, that's too far apart. This is a newborn. They're going to be hungry. You want to feed that um, newborn about every two to three hours. Every four hours, that's not enough. So the correct answer is to maintain the infant's temperature above 97.7. When preventing hypothermia, you prevent cold stress syndrome. You prevent that glucose from dropping. Next question. A mother asked the nurse to tell her about the responsiveness of neonates at birth. Which of the following answers is appropriate? One, babies have poorly developed sense of smell until they're two months old. Two, babies can taste only salty and sour substances at birth. Three, babies are especially sensitive to being touched and cuddled. Or four, babies are nearsighted with blurry vision until they're about three months of age. And guys, the correct answer is three. Babies are especially sensitive to being touched and what? Cuddled. That's why as soon as the baby's born and we've dried them off, we do what? Put them on the mom's chest so that the bonding can occur. Absolutely. Now let's look at our wrong answer choices. We have one, babies are poorly, have a poorly developed sense of smell until they're about two months old. No, they're born with very good, well-developed senses. So that's incorrect. Two, babies can taste only salty and sour substances. No, no. Like I just said, their um, senses are well-developed, even the taste senses. Now I'll say this, they prefer sweet taste than salty or sour, but their taste senses are developed just like the, all the other senses. Um, Choice four, babies are nearsighted with very, well, you know, that's not true because I just told you that at birth, all of their senses are well-developed. So we know that's not true. Matter of fact, they can see up to like uh, 12 or 14 uh, inches in front of them. So the correct answer for this one is choice three. Um, they're sensitive. They like to be touched and they like to be cuddled. A mother, one day postpartum from a three hour labor and a spontaneous vaginal delivery questions the nurse because her baby's face is purple. Upon examination, the nurse notes petechiae over the scalp, forehead and cheeks of the baby. The nurse's response should be based on which of the following? One, petechiae are indicative of severe bacterial infections. Two, rapid deliveries can injure the neonatal presenting part. Three, petechiae are characteristic of normal newborn rash. Or four, the injuries are a sign that the child has been abused. And guys, the correct answer is two. Rapid deliveries can injure the neonatal presenting part. That's absolutely true. How do we know, how do we know that this was a rapid delivery? Go back to the question. It says three hour labor. Mom was only in labor for three hours. This was a rapid delivery. So what is this petechiae we keep seeing? What is that? Those are bruising. Yeah. 
they're bruising. They're bruising that will go away, but you're going to teach the mom that, um, that uh, these petechiae, they're just tiny little hemorrhages. It's bruising because of the rapid delivery. A two-day-old breastfeeding baby was born via spontaneous vaginal delivery has just been weighed in the newborn nursery. The nurse determines that the baby has lost 3.5% of birth weight. Which of the following nursing actions is appropriate? One, do nothing because this is a normal weight loss. Two, notify the neo neonatologist for significant weight loss. Three, advise the mother to bottle feed the baby at the next feed. Or four, assess the baby for hypoglycemia with a glucose monitor. And guys, the correct answer is one. Do nothing. This is a normal weight. Um, so the normal weight loss we expect to see is 5 to 10%. That is the normal range. So with, let me go back to the question, This uh, with this weight loss of 3.5, that falls um, um, into what we expect to see. So this is normal. We're not going to do anything about it. Excuse me. Four newborns are in the neonatal nursery. Which of the babies should the nurse report to the neonatologist? One, a 16-hour baby, 16-hour-old baby who has yet to pass meconium. Two, 16-hour-old baby whose blood glucose is 50. Three, two-day-old baby who's breathing regularly at 70 breaths per minute. Or four, two-day-old baby who's excreting a milky discharge from both nipples. And the correct answer is three, the two day old baby who's breathing irregularly and at 70 breaths per minute. We have some problems here, guys. You know that when it comes to priority patients, which patient we're gonna see first, which patient are we gonna report first, what they're really asking you is which one is in the most danger of dying the quickest, right? Airway, breathing, circulation. Irregular breathing, that's the first problem. And then the second problem is the breast, 70 breaths per minute. Um, the normal for a neonate is what? 30 to 60. The fact that that neonate is breathing 70 breaths per minute, which means that that neonate is uh, tachy, I can never pronounce it, tachypenic, tachypnea. Yes. Okay. So they're tachypenic. That lets you know that that patient's having difficulty breathing and that's why the respirations have increased. So you're going to report that. Now let's look at our other answer choices. One, the 16 hour old baby who has yet to pass meconium. Well, what's the problem? Meconium is the first stool that they ever have. And remember it's sterile because they're gut is sterile. But when do we expect to see that within the first what? 24 hours, it's only been 16 hours. So that newborn has some time. Choice two, the 16 year old baby whose glucose is 50, that's normal. Three, the, excuse me, not three, four, the two-day-old baby who's excreting milky discharge from both nipples. So um, what's happening here, and this is going to go away, but you have to reassure the parents to let them know it's going to go away. The reason this is happening is because of a fluctuation in the hormone level. So, you know, the patient, the newborn's hormone levels were way high because they were getting a lot of that hormone from what? Mommy. But now that the newborn is, you know, out into the world, those hormone levels are going to drop significantly. And so what we see that discharge is just a reaction from that change in the hormone level and it will go away. So you're going to teach that to the parents. I forget what it's called. It's called which is something. I don't remember. Guys, look it up. Somebody put in the comment section. I'm having a brain fart, but it's called which is something and it goes away. It's um, something they expected. We see that often in um, newborns and it will go away. All right. Next question. A nurse notes that a six-hour-old neonate has cyanotic hands and feet. Which of the following actions by the nurse is appropriate? One, place the child in isolate. Two, administer oxygen. Three, swaddle baby in blanket. Or four, apply pulse ox oxim ox oximetna. Oximeter. I'm sorry, guys. In my defense, English is my third language, so don't be too hard on me, guys. All right, so the correct answer is three, swaddle baby in blanket. So here's why. So the patient's extremity is cold, right? When you swaddle the baby, you're doing what? Warming the baby. What happens when you warm them? You're increasing circulation. That is the purpose, so that's why you're gonna swaddle them in a blanket, you're gonna warm them up, and that will increase circulation. 
Next question. A couple's asking the nurse whether or not their son should be circumcised. On which fact should the nurse's response be based? One, boys should be circumcised in order for them to establish positive self-image. Two, boys should not be circumcised because there's no medical rationale for the procedure. Three, experts from the CDC and prevention argue that circumcision is desirable. Or four, a statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics asserts that circumcision is optional. And guys, the only one that can be the correct answer here is four. Statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics asserts that circumcision is optional. Remember guys, whenever a patient asks you for your opinion, do you ever give your opinion? No, that is not your job as a nurse because as a nurse, your opinion carries a lot of weight and the patient may take it as fact. So you never give your opinion. You always want to give factual and objective information. So that's why number four is correct. Look at choice number one and two. You should, you should not. No, those are opinions. You do not give opinions. Choice number three, experts from the CDC and, and prevention argue that circumcision um, is desirable. No, it doesn't. No, they don't. That's not true. So the only true, factual, and objective answer is choice number four. A baby who's to be circumcised by the mother's obstetrician, a baby boy is to be circumcised by the mother's obstetrician. Which of the following actions shows the nurses being a patient advocate? One, before the procedure, the nurse prepares the sterile field for the physician. Two, the nurse refuses to unclothe un the baby until the doctor orders something for pain. Three, the nurse holds the feeding immediately before the circumcision. Or four, after the procedure, the nurse monitors the site for signs of bleeding. And guys, the correct answer is two. The nurse ref refuses to unclothe the baby until the doctor orders something for the pain. That is being a patient advocate. That is standing up for the patient when they're unable to do so for themselves. So absolutely three is the correct answer. A nurse is teaching a mother how to care for her three-day-old son's circumcised penis. Which of the following actions demonstrates that the mother has learned the information? One, the mother cleanses the glands with a cotton swab dipped in hydrogen peroxide. Two, the mother covers the glands with antifungal ointment after rinsing off any discharge. Three, the mother squeezes soapy water from the cloth over the glands. Or four, the mother replaces the dry sterile dressing before putting on the diaper. And guys, the correct answer is three. The mother squeezes soapy water from the washcloth over the glands. So guys, what is she doing? She's not touching um, that surgical site, so she's not irritating it, right? That is the correct answer. She's cleaning that area without irritating it. Now, let's look at our other choices. Uh, one, the mother cleanses the glands with a cotton swab. Hydrogen peroxide? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We know that's wrong. We don't use that, uh, not for circumcision. Two, the mother covers the glands with antifungal ointment. Nope, we don't use that for circumcision either. Four, the mother replaces the dry sterile dressing before putting on a di diaper. Dry sterile dressing, after the circumcision, what is one of the things you teach the parents? That, that after they've cleansed the area, they can do what? Put petroleum jelly like a Vaseline, not a dry dressing because that dry dressing may adhere to that surgical site and cause irritation, cause pain, cause damage, right? So the only correct answer here is number three, where mom is cleaning the penis without touching it, without causing any irritation or damage. A neonate's being admitted to the well baby nursery. Which of the following findings should be referred should be reported to the neonatologist? One, umbilical cord with three vessels. Two, a diamond-shaped anterior fontanelle. Three, cryptocordism. Or four, cafe au lait spot. And guys, what needs to be reported is three, cryptocortism. So what is that? That is when the testy is undescended. That's a problem. Let me tell you something. This is a famous test question, so make sure you know it now. When boys have an undescended testy, that increases their risk for testicular cancer. Yeah, their risk for developing testicular cancer later in life is increased.
Okay, so this is what you're going to notify the doctor about. So let's, um, the other choices, the umbilical cord with three vessels, the diamond-shaped anterior fontanelle, those are normal findings. Your catheter lace spot. Now, let me talk to you about that because look how they tried to trick you. It didn't say cafe au lait spots with an S, right? Because when we see cafe au lait spots with an S, meaning plural, we see many of them. Many times, seeing many of those cafe au lait spots may indicate some sort of neuro neurological uh, uh, dysfunction or disorder. But it said cafe au lait spot, as in singular, right? Are we concerned about that? No, that one spot is going to go away on its own. So what we're concerned about is that undescended testy, your cryptocortism. A female African-American baby's been admitted into the nursery. Which of the following physiological findings would the nurse assess as normal? Select all that applies. All right, guys. How do we treat select all that applies? As what? True or false? Let's go. One. Purple colored patches on the buttocks and torso. True. We, we, we expect to see that. That's a normal finding. What are those? Mongolian spots. And what you're going to do is teach the parents that they're going to go away. They will eventually fade. Choice two, bilateral, oh, uh, bilateral whitish discharge from the, uh, from the breast, which is milk. For the life of me, I couldn't remember what it's called, which is milk. So this is when we see, I talked to you about that, that um, milk, uh, that whitish discharge from the breast. And what happened, the reason the child has this is because um, the hormone level that they had from the mom when they were in the womb has significantly de decreased. And so that uh, a discharge that we see is a reaction from that. It's going to go away. It's temporary. You're going to teach the patient. You're going to teach the parents that, which is milk. That's what it's called. Um, choice three, a bloody discharge from the vagina. True. As distressing as this is to the parents, especially in African-American babies, um, this is a normal finding. This is called pseudo -men uh, menses. Pseudo meaning fake, false. Menses, you know what menses is, your, your period, right? So a false period. Um, this is expected finding. And again, the same reason we see the witch's milk is the same reason we see the pseudomensis because of the change in the hormones. So you're going to, as distressing as it is to the parents, let them know this is expected finding. It's going to go away on its own. It's temporary. Choice four, sharp, sharply demarcated dark area around the face. False. What's that? Your port wine stain, right? And that is not temporary. That's going to be permanent. That's going to be forever. All right. Um, choice, um, five dark hair covered dimple at the base of the spine. False. That is not a normal finding. And actually, if you see that you should suspect possibly, um, uh, spinal, uh, spinal bifida. You should suspect spinal bifida. And so what they're going to do is do an ultrasound right? But this is not normal finding. It's not expected. So for this question, when they're asking about normal findings for an African-American uh, uh, newborn, the correct answer is one, two, and three. The nurse is assessing a newborn on admission to the newborn nursery. Which of the following findings should the nurse report to the neonatologist? One, inter intracostal retractions, Two, kaput succedinum. Three, Epstein pearls. Or four, harlequin sign. Harlequin sign. And guys, the correct answer is one, intracostal retractions. What does that mean? When you see intracostal retractions, you see the nasal flaring, you see the tachypnea, that means that this patient's in what? Respiratory respiratory distress. So you're going to report that choices two, three, and four are all normal findings in the neonate. So no need to report. Four babies have been admitted to the neonatal uh, nursery. Which, which of the babies should the nurse assess first? Whenever you get a question about who are you going to assess first, what they're really asking you is who is in most danger of dying the quickest. So who are we going to assess first? One, baby with respirations of 42, oxygen saturation 96. Two, baby with APCAR not, score 9 out of 9, the weight is 4660. Three, baby with temperature of 
length 21 inches or for baby with glucose 55 heart rate 121 and guys the correct answer is two baby with abgar nine out of nine weight 4660 look at how they tried to trick you and uh, if you guys have been following my videos for any amount of time, I talk to you about this all the time. Test writers love to do this. They'll give you something true, comma, and everything behind that comma is wrong. And what they want you to do is be so mesmerized by the true answer at the beginning that you forget about everything else that was behind the comma. Don't fall for it, guys. If the entire answer choice is not correct, the entire answer choice is wrong. Get rid of it and choose the next best answer. So let's look at this. APGAR score of nine out of nine. That's wonderful. We love the APGAR score of nine out of nine. But look at that weight, 4660. Excuse me, what is the normal weight supposed to be? Between 2,500 to about 4,000 grams. This patient has 4,660, so they got a whole 660 extra. That is a problem. So that's who we're gonna to go to first. Choices one, three, and four are normal findings. All right, guys. Oh, I'm already past my time. Okay, I'll do one more question. One last question, guys. A mother asked whether or not she should be concerned that her baby never opens his mouth to breathe when his nose is so small. Which of the following is the nurse's best response? One, the baby does rarely open his mouth, but you can see that he isn't in any distress. Two, babies usually breathe in and out through their nose so they can feed without choking. Three, everything about babies is small. It's truly amazing how everything works so well. Four, you're right. I will report the baby's small nasal openings to the pediatrician right away. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is two. Babies usually breathe in and out through their noses so they can feed without choking. Guys, how else are they going to suck, swallow, breathe? So this is a true and accurate statement, number one. And number two, you actually answered mom's question. So that is the correct answer. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, the baby does rarely open his mouth, but you can see that he isn't in any distress. You didn't answer her question. Number one's factual, yeah. The child's not in any distress, but did you answer the question? Absolutely not, that's wrong. Three, everything about baby so small is truly amazing. You did not answer mom's question. Choice number four, you're right. No, she's not right. <laughs> so you're not gonna call the doctor, guys. I got spill everywhere, sorry. So the correct answer is two. You wanna give accurate, factual, objective information. Guys, I hope um, this video was helpful to you. This actually was my first video that I've done strictly on newborns. If you found it to be helpful, if you'd like to see more videos on newborns, please let me know in the comments and I'll make sure I line up more of them for you. If there's something else that you'd rather see me cover, guys, uh, please make sure you put in the comments so I can make sure I get that video out for you. Um, Please, guys, I get so many emails from me. And I thank you because I do this for you. Because I remember when I was a nursing school student and how hard it was for me. And it didn't have to be that hard. And I said, man, I wish I had somebody to kind of help guide me, right? And so I'm so happy that I can do it for you. So when you guys, you know, send me those emails or you write in the comments how I've helped you, I'm so appreciative. And I tell God, thank you for giving me this gift that I can share with you. And I'm telling you guys, if you want to give back to me or you want to show your appreciation, the best two things that you can do for me, number one, like and subscribe below, right? Like and subscribe below. And two, share my content. Share my content on your Facebook or on your TikTok or on your Instagram. Help my channel grow. Help my channel grow. Like, listen, I'm happy for my little 25K, but I'm trying to grow. Help me grow, guys. Um, don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, www.nexusnursinginstitute.com. I got my coffee mug. So when you guys are studying in your study group, you got my coffee mug. If you guys want to support me, you can purchase a coffee mug. And it's a wonderful graduation gift for anyone you know that's graduating from the nursing program. Um, I have... Um, what do you call them? Study guides coming out soon. I have study guides that are coming out soon that you will be able to 
purchase for a minimal fee. I'm talking about $1.99, a minimal fee, and you can download it. And I'm going to give you the most important things you need to know for that subject that you're most likely going to see on your next test for it. So watch out for that, guys. Thank you so, so much for all of your support. And you'll be seeing me on the next video.